It's time now for the award-winning number one local talk show in Northeast Pennsylvania, The Sam LaSant Show. Now here's your host, Sam LaSant. Hi folks, I'm Sam LaSant. Thanks for joining us. And folks, as I keep telling you about the Hazelton Health Alliance, we get better and better all the time. Uh, and new doctors are coming in. It's exciting. Uh, as I said before, folks, uh, you know, before you are thinking of leaving this area for health care, Check your credentials of the doctors we have here in the healthcare, second to none. I'm very happy today to introduce to you uh, Dr. Sheila Hockman. Uh, and Dr. Hockman is with the Alliance Medical Group up there with my good friend Dr. Muir and uh, Jennifer Ruck. Uh, and she uh, brings, I'm sure, a lot of good um, of, of medical knowledge to us. Doctor, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm glad to see that we're, we're getting exciting doctors into our area. It's, it's very nice, um, uh, and it, it's a compliment to the Hazelton Health Alliance. You're, tell us a little bit about you, who you are, and where you come from, and all that good stuff. Well, I was uh, raised in Houston, met and married my husband there. My children were born there, and then in 89, we moved to Bucks County. My husband is actually a Pennsylvania boy, so... Uh -huh. Uh, he was raised in Bucks County, and um, uh, probably after I finished residency, I decided that I wanted to do rural medicine, which I did for almost 10 years, and it finally came a point that we wanted to return back to Pennsylvania, and that's how I ended up here in Hazleton. Wow. Now, you decided to become a doctor in high school or college? Or yes, what? in uh, high school. What, why? Mm -hmm. what, what was the reason? Uh, it was just a calling. Anyone I, in your family was a doctor? Nope, no one. <clears throat> and at the time that I went back to college to become a physician, uh, no one had gone beyond a high school degree in your at family. that point. Yes, in yeah. my family. Yeah. So you were the first. Yeah. yeah same in, in my family. It's a mm -hmm. thrill, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. is. To become a doctor, I think that's great. Yeah. Now, what part did you did you want to go into obstetrics and gynecology? I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? It, it, it's something that you can't really describe. You have to be drawn to it, almost a calling, mm -hmm. so to speak, um, because it's you have crazy hours. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very unpredictable lifestyle, mm -hmm. and it's something that you have to really. So you're half nuts, then, huh? Yeah. Yeah, you, you got to be half crazy <laughs> to do the thing. Uh, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, it's it's uh, it, it is. You have to be dedicated mm -hmm. to what you do because it, it it certainly is a challenge. I always like to ask people those questions because you wonder. You, you like to know why a person. You know, you, you have to have a passion for what you do. Right. It cannot be a job. It has to be a passion for what you do. Okay. So you you practice ten years in Houston. Okay. Uh, no. no, I was in rural, underserved. I was in Wisconsin, and I was in um, West Virginia. Okay. So what made you come to uh, Hazleton? Well, um, it was rural, but it wasn't that rural. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have the benefits of both worlds. Mm -hmm. You have the big city things. I know everybody laughs when I say that, but when you've practiced in no. very yeah. rural, underserved America, it, it's a wonderful experience to be here. So, so when you when you're th when you're you know you and your husband, what's your husband's name? Tim. Tim, uh, and you have two children. You said right. Mm -hmm. And what are their names? T.J. and Jillian. Now, are they up in this area too, or, or no? My son is. Okay. T.J. is. Okay, and your daughter is. is she that? is in Wisconsin. Uh -huh. That is where she went to school, uh -huh. and she's now working. Good. Out on her own. Thank you. So now, <laughs> when you're sitting down with Tim, is it Tim, your mm -hmm. husband, and you're having coffee and say, Tim, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to go to Hazleton and I'm going to practice up there, okay? What would, what would some of the things that you look for? Because, see, we live, when people live in this mm -hmm. area, uh, sometimes you become blind to what happens because it's like right. people live in New York City. Uh, you, you talk to a, a native, they say, have you been to the Statue of Liberty? Nah, but they see it every day. Right. Have you been to the Empire State? Nah, but they see it every day. But, so when we have doctors like you, qualified doctors coming to the area, what are some of the reasons why you decided to come to this area? Um, well, we had lived in Bucks County for numerous <coughs> years. And um, being away you start to uh, almost romanticize about coming back to the area. So when we did come back, we thought, okay, what are the things that at this point in our life we're looking forward to? We wanted accessibility to not only New York, but also to Philadelphia. Um, we wanted to be able to have good restaurants, but not be able 
not be right in the center of town. So when you look at Hazleton, we were also very familiar with it. I went to college and did medical school in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I did all of my training in St. Luke's Network, which is in Allentown and Bethlehem. So Hazleton was a very ter you know familiar territory mm -hmm. to me. So. And the people here are fantastic. They're I mean, wonderful. Yeah. They're, how long you been up here now? A little over a week. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you're back. You said, "Well, you, you're going to find that." I'm sure you've you, you know you met you're working with Dr. Muir right. and, and and the in the fine doctors now uh, obstetric uh, obstetrics and gynecology and there are certain areas that you know um, uh, that you bring some expertise to okay and 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 some of the questions uh, we wanted to just address them I don't think too many men are be uh, no. involved here but <laughs> primarily you um, the um, pelvic organ prolapse what is pelvic organ prolapse I know it but I want the people to know that well if you want to put it in a very basic term it is when you have the dropping of the bladder or the protruding of the rectum up into the vagina and most women have at least heard of this at one point in their life. You know, it's primarily linked to childbirth. You know, our children are a fabulous gift, but they also can wreak a lot of destruction on our pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. Now, when you, is it a certain ages that it happens, okay? Yes. Or do you have to have a, a child, have to have a, a child to get this? Uh, you don't have to, but, but it is most commonly mm -hmm. occurs in someone who has had children. Mm -hmm. um, excuse me, the average age for a woman to develop it is 50. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, you tend to see more and more of it. Well, and what happens? The pelvic? The, if, if you, the, the way I explain it to my patients is if you look at the vagina and yeah. the architecture as a room in your home, mm -hmm. above the ceiling is the bladder. Below the floor is the rectum. Well, if someone comes to you and says, well, I have a dropped bladder. Well, that means that basically their ceiling has caved in. Mm -hmm. The bladder has dropped down into the vagina. Now, if it's a rectocele, that simply is the exact opposite of that. Mm -hmm. The rectum is protruding up into the vagina or their floor has buckled. Mm -hmm. Is this a serious thing? It is not life-threatening. Mm -hmm. It does not tend to get better with age. It actually mm -hmm. tends to get worse. And what are the symptoms you said? A lot of women will describe a sensation of pain, pressure. Some even have leakage of urine. Mm -hmm. And now you said the causes are primarily childbearing and it just takes its time before mm -hmm. it develops. Um, <clears throat> now, how does one know that they have this? I mean, I'm sure it could be... Right. Uh, a lot of times they don't know for sure, but the most outright signs of it is if you physically see or feel a bulge protruding from the vagina. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have had a physician ever examine you in the past and they have related this to you. Which brings me to another thing, okay? Um, first of all, I've said this before. Women are the stronger of the species. Men are big babies. You're looking at one. <clears throat> I get a pain, I go to the doctor, I have everything. I'm a nervous wreck. I wouldn't want to be a woman today in a million years because of what they have to go through. <clears throat> and I admire the stamina of women. I mean that sincerely because, you know, it took me three years ago to call an OSPE, which is a piece of cake, but I'm fearful of that stuff. With that being said, <clears throat> what, do you, how, how, what do you tell women as far as examinations are concerned? How often should they go to a gynecologist? When should they start? Um, because some people think there's, there's nothing wrong and then something happens, okay, I don't know if there's anything at pre preventative stuff or whatever. What would you be a rule of thumb that you're telling the female audience as to why, when they should go to a gynecologist to get, get a, a, a regular exam? Uh, <clears throat> I would say that starting at age 21, women need to start seeing their physician for a pap smear. Under that age, they only need to be seen as problems occur or they want to start birth control. After that, it's really dependent on the woman's health status as to whether she comes every year, every two years, every three years. And that's something that she can have a discussion with her provider mm -hmm. and they can discuss what, what fits. So basically, if you're 21 years old, you should really 
make a call. Okay, folks, if you just tuned in, I'm talking to Dr. Sheila Hockman. She's new in the area, and she's up there with the Alliance Medical Group with Dr. Um, or with Dr. Muir, a very good friend of mine, and also Jennifer Ruck, who was on the Sam Lasan show, bringing a lot of good talent into this area. And if you'd like to uh, make an appointment uh, or call up there, it's 501-6450. That's 501-6450. I'm always excited when I have these shows because I learn a lot, okay, about different things, and it's it's so nice to see the nice people we're having coming into the area. Um, now, uh, getting back to organ, uh, pelvic organ prolapse, okay, um, first of all, how was it diagnosed, you said? Uh, by a physical exam. Uh -huh. And it, typically it's going to be your gynecologist that is going to unearth <coughs> this. Okay, now, okay, you, you do an exam, and you find out that the person does have this, okay? Yes. Are there degrees in this? Yes, very much so. Um, if you look at it in very basic terms, you have mild, moderate, severe. Mild, uh, probably no symptoms at all. Mm -hmm. It's there. Um, will it get worse? Never know. Just have to monitor okay, it and see. Okay, if you find it at mild, mm -hmm. okay, can you prevent it to going to moderate? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, if there are <coughs> risk factors the woman has, such mm -hmm. as is she overweight? If she is, then if she brings herself to a normal weight, that is going to reduce it <coughs> immensely. Mm -hmm. um, if she is a smoker, stop smoking. Um, because chronic coughing can actually worsen prolapse. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you find it, it's diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Then we go to the, how do we treat it? Well, for a very mild case of prolapse, your basic Kegel exercises can help strengthen the pelvic floor, okay? Um, in cases that the woman only has moderate prolapse, you can monitor it and see how she does. In cases of severe, most of these are surgically corrected. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about it nowadays is it is all outpatient surger surgery. Mm -hmm. So that's how you, you, yeah. you treat them. Um, but once again, it's always good to find it way before it gets right. to the severe. Okay, and that is through an exam. Okay, mm -hmm. now, how can pelvic organ prolapse be prevented? I'm always into the preventive. Right. Type. Uh, the biggest things are reducing the risk factors. Like I said before, if you're smoking, stop it. If you're overweight, okay, overweight, let's stop talk that. about let's talk about smoking because that's mm -hmm. one of my pet peeves. And and, and, and 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 you know, you hate to tell a person who's addicted to smoking. You know, it, it's it's not as easy to quit, especially when you're. But the danger is every time I talk to anybody, any doctor, anybody, um, physician, or and we talk about smoking and red flags pop up. Why is it, tell the women why it's so bad for them to smoke? Well, if you, you are just looking at pelvic organ prolapse, well, it's going to do that. Okay, in general. But in general, you know, you're going to increase your risk for stroke, heart disease, <coughs> just to name a few, that's, that's the big ones. And if they're at all concerned about their appearance, you know, it's going to really impact how their skin looks too. How about young women who are in, in their teenagers, okay, and uh, in the early 20s, okay, does smoking have any effect on the reproductive organs? Absolutely. Explain um, that, because I tell this to women and they think I'm nuts. No, no, smoking actually slows the movement or the transport of the egg into the uterus to be fertilized. These women are gonna have a higher chance of an ectopic pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So, and that in itself can be life-threatening, so. And then you have women who, who are in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s, okay. Of course, when you see a girl, a woman who is in their 80s smoking, there's no way they're gonna quit <laughs> smoking because they said, I'm 80 years old, you know. But, but again, they're working against the odds. You know, when I grew up in parties, well, there was the, the guys used to smoke cigars and pipes and drink three, you know, their shots a day, and they were 80 some, 70 some years old. Well, that was, you know, very rare. But in talking about preventative, you know, et cetera, and, and it's, it's just, I don't know what you have to do to convince, particularly when I see young women smoking. I just, it breaks mm -hmm. my heart, Doc. It really does, you know. It does, but it's also something where you can lead them, but they have to ultimately make that decision. It's it's not hip. It's not. I mean, yeah. it can be. When, okay, so you can prevent 
Um, and how, do you, how can you prevent it? Well, stop smoking. Okay. Bring your weight to a normal weight. Okay. When you say normal weight, uh, would they know that, what their normal weight should be if they come to the examination? Exactly. Uh, let's assume a person is 50 pounds overweight. Um, do they have to lose 50 pounds or could they lose 30? It, 10 would improve Would it. improve, okay. Just as uh, long as, because weight does what? It actually is going to help <coughs> break down the structure of the pelvic floor. Okay. So it's good to... Um, to, to and, to stop that. And what are and what, and what are the things? <laughs> heavy lifting. If you're someone that's in a job where you do a lot of heavy lifting, find ways to use good body mechanics or reduce the overall workload. I mean, women are not built to be workhorses. Mm -hmm. Now, what should I do, not me, female, if I feel I have any of these symptoms? Call your doctor. Or call me. That's it. Well, that, that's what I'm, what I'm saying is if I feel like I have um, the, 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 the symptoms that you're talking about, you know, I should call, a, call you and say, look, set up an appointment. The rule of thumb, uh, I, again, going back to these shows are, are, I like to have them informative, introduce a doctor who's coming to the area and, you know, um, what do you think you bring to the table? I think this is a an area of medicine that um, is very much underdiagnosed and undertreated. And it's not something that women have to live with. It's not a part of aging. It should not be considered a normal part of aging. Mm -hmm. And if correcting this can improve a woman's quality of life, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. And th that's the whole thing, improving quality of life. The, the fact that we have all of the advances in medicine that we have today and the techniques that we have, um, it's, it doesn't make too much sense mm -hmm. not to take advantage of what's available out there today. Right. Yeah. So wh what do you tell these people, you know, that have not been to uh, a gynecologist in, in, in a number of years and they're in their, you know, 40s and 50s and figure there's nothing wrong with me? Right. It, take baby steps. You know, come in get your physical exam, and start from there. There are some people that think that if they have a cesarean section, they can prevent um, the uh, prolapse. That is something that's more or less a wives' tale. It is not true. It's in and of the fact that you just being pregnant is going to put you at a risk of that. Now, if you deliver vaginally, it's going to really impact that also. I mean, a woman after having two vaginal deliveries has an eight time greater risk of developing mm -hmm. prolapse. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, a C-section is only a procedure you wanna have done if it's medically necessary. How long after you have a baby should you be, be concerned about this? I mean, this doesn't happen right after you, you know. No, no. Um, most women who have had their children should go back for a six-week checkup. And mm -hmm. at that point, you'd be able to tell mm -hmm. if you have anything starting. Mm -hmm. So, again, a rule of thumb is try to get to, um, you know, the, your gynecologist at least once a year. Right. Okay. And hysterectomies. Okay. Where some, some young girls today feel um, that in their 30s, um, after they had their children, that if they've been experiencing some concerns, they feel a hysterectomy is, they should have it, that'll clear a lot of, you know, things up. Is that, tell me about that. Well, depending on their problems, it can fix a lot of their issues. But if you look back at pelvic organ prolapse, what you've done by doing that hysterectomy is removed a lot of the support structure for all of those organs to stay where they should be. Well, I know, because sometimes, <clears throat> you know, women get together and they, you know, they, they, they have a couple of kids mm -hmm. and they say, well, have the hysterectomy and you'll be in great shape after that. I don't know. I mean, if there's something seriously wrong, but some of the things that, you know, you shouldn't be doing is maybe just letting your body develop the way it should develop. Is, mm -hmm. is that, um, in terms of, of um, women's health, all right, uh, which is the medical group's all about, uh, your health, that's our specialty, which is your slogan here, okay? Right. Um, what do you recommend, okay, women to do, okay, who are in their 
40s and 50s and 60s, particularly how about elderly women who are in their 70s? Sometimes women feel, you know, if they're in their 70s, they don't really need to, to go to a gynecologist. True or false? That is very false. It doesn't matter their age, whether they're 40, 50, <clears throat> 80, 100, mm -hmm. they still need to be seen. Even if they've had a hysterectomy <clears throat> and they're beyond the point of needing a pap smear, that doesn't mean mm -hmm. they've bypassed the exam that we provide them with. You always have the, um, you know, I'm, I'm one. Uh, I'm afraid to go for the test. I'm afraid they're going to find something. You know, uh, you yeah. know, uh, you know uh, and again, I'm a big baby because that's what I would be doing. Oh, I'm afraid they're going to find something. But in, in the case with women, pap smears, mammograms, these are all the things that you necessarily do. Because I guess, again, if you should find something at an early stage, it's a lot better. Correct? It's far more manageable to find it early. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I get that. I understand that people are afraid, you know, very fearful of finding out they have something really bad. And that's human nature. Sure. But to catch it early is, is the best thing. For anything. For anything. Okay. Uh, folks, if you just tuned in, I'm talking to Dr. Sheila, Sheila Hawkman. Uh, she's from Houston, here in the Hazleton area now. Uh, and uh, she is uh, up at the Alliance Medical Group. The number up there to call is 501-6450. Uh, we were doing this Health Alliance show, um, and I don't know, I was telling Melanie, I think, uh, uh, maybe about a year ago. How long? We were doing the show a while, right, Melanie? But what we, we saved the person's life because the person was listening. And I, I'm trying to think of, of, of who it was. And it was a new doctor coming into town and talking about different things. And the person was watched the show and said, you know, I, I, I'm thinking. And, and thank God they went and they found something at a stage that was just a little bit beyond that it should be. However, if they would have waited long enough, it would have been, well, we don't know. Mm. It would have been a difficult situation. With that being said, as a doctor, okay, and you know what's available out there for preventative medicine and, and just coming for a checkup and you'd see that. Have you experienced in your life so far, and you're a young girl, I know that, but I mean, have you experienced where you've seen someone and said to yourself, my God, if this person would only come in maybe a year ago, et cetera. Mm -hmm. have, have you seen that? Too many times. Is that right? Way too many. What, what, are, what were some of the uh, areas, without, certainly without mentioning names, what were some of the areas that you found that they should have been coming to you or, or getting their uh, examination? The two big ones yeah. that I've run into <coughs> over the years are <coughs> ovarian cancer and uterine cancer. Um, for whatever reason, you know, women being the, the caregivers of the family, their mindset is, well, I'll wait until a limb is hanging off before I go in because I've got to take care of everybody else. That's a typical woman, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Um, I'm, I'm guilty of that too. Yeah. But um, just annual maintenance of your body. I mean, you, you take your car in to have it tuned up. Yeah. That your body is really no different. So talking about the ovarian cancer, which I understand is a silent thing that people, mm -hmm. how, how do you, I mean, how do you, sometimes you can't, Detect that, right? Well, it's very <coughs> difficult to, de to detect, mm -hmm. but there are some subtle signs mm -hmm. that, even though they may be vague, can help lead you in the right direction. Which means that you have to depend on the gynecologist, okay, right. who has the experienced eye to be able to look at that. And I, I think being thorough these days, sometimes people, uh, I don't blame any doctor today for the amount of tests that they send people for because they want to be thorough, okay. I'm just hoping that <clears throat> we can continue to have that, uh, this kind of health care, and I'm not being political, in, in the future because, you know, what happens is we mentioned about 60, 70, 80 years old, okay, mm -hmm. we don't want to be told that you cannot go for a mammogram if you're over 75 or 80, okay, because, or, or a, a physical exam. It's important to be able to, to, be able to do that because you've, you've seen that. Um, recommendations, again, you're, you're, um, you said uterine cancer, okay. Right. Can you detect, detect that? A pap smear mm -hmm. will help pick that up. Mm -hmm. And how important are mammograms? extremely important mm -hmm. what's the if you've never had a history uh, in your family what age should you be going for 40 
40. And now, doctor, you think uh, you should get a mammogram every year, every three years, every five years? What do you think? I am an every year kind of gal. Okay. I had a very, very close friend of mine die of breast cancer at age 37. So okay. I'm. But she was 37. Mm -hmm. Had there been a history in her family? No history. So how, what would be the, because normally they're telling mm -hmm. people at 40, right? Right. Okay. Feel, now what about self-examination? Yes, for, that's yeah. also extremely important. Yeah. Um, and how often should a woman uh, self, do a self-breast examination? Every month. If they're still having periods, it needs to be the week after their period. If they are postmenopausal, mm -hmm. then I tell them, pick a day of the month, make it the first, and do it that day. And no matter what age, I mean, excuse me, I mean, it's teenagers doing the same thing? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They're never too young to start. Yeah. And, and so you, you lost a good friend for breast cancer, mm -hmm. right? And those are the kind of things that just break your heart. I okay. do. Um, now, I want to just repeat, okay, because sometimes people turn in and they'll see who's this pretty girl with Sam LaSant. Um, and I'm talking to Dr. Sheila Hawkman, folks, and she's will be at the Hazelton, uh, the Alliance Medical Group, up there with Dr. Muir and Jennifer Ruck. Saying that right? Okay. Um, pelvic, once again, what is pelvic uh, organ prolapse? It is the dropping of the bladder into the vagina or the protruding of the rectum up into the vagina. And what causes this? Heavy lifting, chronic coughing, childbirth is the big culprit, and obesity. And what about? Smoking. Smoking. Mm -hmm. I hate smoking, you know that. What are the symptoms? Uh, it's often a bulge, pressure, pain in the pelvis or in the vagina, and often, well, sometimes they will actually see a bulge at the <coughs> vaginal opening or protruding. So basically, if you are 50 or older, you should, in your, in your yearly exams, you know, you're examining all this stuff, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and and I, so, therefore, I have it, and you said there's mild, severe, um, mild, moderate, and severe. Right. Okay. So how do you treat it? It depends. You know, if it's mild, Kegel exercises, reduce your weight if you're overweight, you know, stop smoking. smoking if you're smoking. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a heavy lifter, stop it. Mm -hmm. Because that, no, so it's not life threatening. No. But it can be detected. Right. Uh, I'm all for preventative medicine, especially the fact that I've said, doctor, we've had tremendous doctors in this area, and, and I'm sure you're, you're going to do extremely well. Uh, you have a passion for it. I wish you the best, and Thank welcome you. to the Greater Hazelton area. Thank you, know. you very much. And tell my good friend, Dr. Muir, I said hello, okay? I will. Folks, I'm talking to um, the Dr. Sheila Hockman. Uh, she is, is up at the Alliance Medical Group. You can contact her at 501-6450. I've said this before, folks. Um, say thank you to all the healthcare people that work in the area, the nurses, the, everyone uh, who works in the hospitals. Uh, they work hard, they really do. Uh, I had an experience to go to the emergency room about a, a week and a half ago. Didn't want to be there, but I was there, and I gotta tell you, first class, they treated me fantastic, and I wanna thank them for their, uh, for, for the response that they gave me. It was just fantastic. 501-6450, uh, Sheila Hockman. She's the new girl on the block, and she's fantastic. We'll see you next time.